Welcome back. What is a perceptually uniform color space? Why does it exist? How does it apply to Minecraft? And why is a geologist talking to you about it? These are all great questions, and I'll answer three of them. Understanding color spaces is very important if you're doing anything with color. Even if that is just editing a photo on your phone, it helps to understand what is actually happening behind the veil. For me, they have become a tool, and the more I learn about them, the more applications I see. In Minecraft, understanding color spaces can really help you with builds or understanding why specific build palettes work or what can be done to improve one. But before we talk about this beautiful thing behind me, we should look at the issues with the most common color space, RGB. RGB space has red, green, and blue values that are usually represented from 0 to 255 in decimal or hex or from zero to 100%. If you add each color in equal parts, you get some neutral tones from black to white and every other color comes from some combination of those three colors. And when I say all colors, I mean only those that are displayed in RGB, which is what's used for most monitors. The human eye can see more colors than a normal monitor can create. And today, anytime you hear RGB, most likely it's actually sRGB or standard RGB. The other form of RGB without the S is linear RGB, but it's pretty common to see both being referenced without the S. So it's a bit confusing sometimes to know which one somebody's talking about. For the rest of the video, if I say RGB, I mean sRGB, and I'll specifically say linear RGB if I mean the other. And if you hear me say RPG, I probably also mean sRGB. In our eyes, we have rods and cones that detect photons of different wavelengths. The rods are for black and white, and the cones are for color. There are actually three types of cones though, and they are sensitive to the different wavelengths of light that we perceive as blue, green, and red. These cones have some overlap, so we don't need to have cells sensitive to every individual wavelength. When different cones are activated simultaneously, our brain averages them out to give us the perception of an intermediate color. This can be because a single wavelength is activating two types of cones at once, or you can have two wavelengths of light activating them in different amounts. These photons don't even need to be coming from exactly the same location. We can just put varying amounts of red, green, and blue close to each other, and we will perceive the average color. These are just strips of red, green, and blue next to each other, but we perceive a full spectrum of color. This is how screens work. Each pixel is not making a different wavelength of light. It's just varying the amount of red, green, and blue it produces. This iPhone uses these little diamonds instead of strips, but the effect is still the same. Let's get back to our RGB issues. As a side note, you can get some pretty cool patterns from this. As you change your distance and angle you're looking at it, the strips are sampled differently by Minecraft, so you can get these like different effects. If we wanted a smooth transition of color from blue to red in RGB, you could take the two end values and then you can just divide the distance into however many divisions you want and gradually change the values to get from one to the other. The first issue we will look at is that RGB tends to darken the colors in the middle of these transitions. I'll also add red to green and green to magenta in here and then bring these up close. You can see that even though these are smooth transitions, the colors get darker in the middle. A better transition would have a linear change in perceived brightness along with color. If we place these colors back into the RGB color space, we end up getting this arc between the endpoints and then a non-linear distance between each of the colors. They're closer in the middle here, and then they're kind of spaced out at the ends. And that's because while the RGB system is great for computers, it's not exactly how our eyes actually work. You might think that if you had a source of light and you doubled its intensity, you would perceive double the brightness. But our eyes are actually a lot more sensitive to darker colors than they are to lighter colors. We would see something about 50% bright when the light's only putting out about 25% intensity. We apply a gamma correction to RGB to get to sRGB and make that line linear again. I can take that gamma correction out of our example here and you'll see that our transitions will straighten out a bit. They're not perfect. This space is linear RGB and is commonly used to get better results when blending, but we can do better. Another common space is HSV or HSV, which I've talked about before. It's not really a different color space. It's still RGB. It's just rearranged so the numbers are easier for humans to, to work with. If we look at a ring of pastel colors going through all the hues, it's a relatively smooth transition, but a similar issue is going to happen. If we bring it up here. Even though these colors here actually have the same saturation and brightness, 
their perceived brightness varies with changes in hue. And this is because the human eye doesn't treat all colors the same. To a human eye, a bright blue will never be as bright as a green or a yellow can be. If we adjust these colors to keep the same apparent brightness all the way across and then plot these colors back into RGB space, we get this shape that I call the discarded rubber band. But you can see that we have to saturate the blues over here a lot more than we have to do some of the other colors to maintain that apparent brightness. And even if we look at this example in linear RGB, you can see that it's still a little bit weird. It's flat on one side and it's got this little bump out on the reds and another bump over in the blues. So this is something that linear space cannot really help us with. HSB is also commonly used as a color picker for many programs. You can use them to select a different tone or shade of a specific hue or keep everything else the same and just adjust the hue. If we look at our example, sliced from yellow to blue, this right hand side is what you would see in a color picker. You might notice that it doesn't actually keep the same hue. It's blue on the edge and then it gets this purple tint in towards the middle. Other color spaces are made to address specific shortcomings like the ones I've showed you. There is no perfect color space. There are only those that are better for the specific task that you were doing. I'm gonna be talking about a relatively new color space called OK Lab. It was published back in 2020 and satisfies many desirable properties of a uniform color space. Perceptually uniform spaces are useful when you are working with image processing or doing blending and gradients. Let's define a uniform color space. One way to describe it is if you have one solid color and then you gradually started changing it, there would be a moment when your eyes could detect that it was a different color. For this example, this is pure green up here. And then down here, I've gradually added more blue to it. On this end, you can see a difference. And on this end, you cannot. And the result of this is gonna depend on a lot of different things. Currently, I've done this on three different computers and five different monitors, and the results keep changing. Besides hardware, it's dependent on my eyes, and for you, it's dependent on your eyes and the YouTube compression. For me, I can notice the first difference right here somewhere in the middle. If we took those two colors and plotted them into our color space, there would be a measurable distance between the two of them. We're gonna do this again for red, and I'm gonna add yellow to it. I can see a change all the way down here. We're gonna plot those two colors down there. We'll look at black. For these top two colors, I'm changing in increments of 10. For black, I'm changing in increments of one. And even at one, I can tell a difference right here on this first change. So we're gonna plot that. And now if we look at these distances in the world, see this distance here, and we'll see that this red distance is a little bit closer together. And the black distance all the way over here is almost on top of each other. In a uniform color space, this distance would all be the same. The smallest detectable change would be the same no matter what color you started with. This is very important for image editing or dealing with lighting in video games. If you change hue, saturation, and brightness, you want colors to change in the same way. Now that all of that's out of the way, let's convert RGB into OK Lab. The first step is removing that gamma correction to get back to linear RGB space. We then convert to a space called uh, XYZ or CIE XYZ. It's a very common intermediate step for a lot of color space conversion. It was made in the 1930s by the International Commission on Illumination, and it's made to contain every color possibly seen by humans and then some. From there, we can actually approximate the human cone response. This is normally called LMS space for the long, medium, and short wavelengths. And then we can reapply that gamma to make it linear to our vision. And then finally, we kind of just straighten it all up, tweak a few things, and it's converted into OK Lab. For lab space, the L stands for lightness, which goes from black down at the bottom up to white up at the top. And then there's the A axis, which is the magenta and green axis. And then the B is from blue all the way over to yellow. And since we're only dealing with colors that are reproducible in the RGB space, you can still make out the RGB square uh, kind of distorted into the OK Lab space. You have, your, you have your red, green, and blue corners, and then your cyan, magenta, and yellow corners.
we can load our previous examples and see how they end up in uh, OK Lab. You can see that our transitions end up being this evenly spaced, nice linear lines, and our discarded rubber band ends up being this nice donut again. So if you're doing math, trying to find color between two points, it's relatively simple. Great, nice. We have a uniform color space. How will it make me the best Minecraft builder? Let's load some blocks into the space. I'm going to get rid of all the squares in a second. I just wanted to show you that they all, all the blocks fit into this nice shape. You can kind of see how they're represented in there around their average colors and everything like that. So yeah, let's get rid of the colors and just leave the blocks. So this is just all blocks as entities without making them face necessarily the right direction. So some might look out of place. Like there's two bee nests, three bee nests here. One is from the bottom color, one is from the side color, and one is from, you know, this other, the top maybe, I'm not sure. I'll be using the real blocks and getting the orientations correct for the next release of the color world. As I've talked about in other videos, we can use a space like this to build palettes and make transitions. Technically, this would probably be the best space to work in. So I haven't done this yet, uh, so I don't know what the results are going to be, but I'm going to make a few block transitions in RGB space, and then look at those same transitions in OK Lab space and see if it really changes what blocks I would pick. Um, in any real meaningful way. Before I do it, I suspect that since we have a relatively limited palette in Minecraft, this might not make too big of a difference. <laughs> and I'm absolutely wrong. It made a huge difference. I picked two blocks as endpoints and then did a gradient from one to the other in RGB, and then again in OK Lab with the same endpoints. We'll look at the red to green starting in RGB first. So if I highlight the blocks that I chose here, you can see that I started down here with red wool, and then my goal was up at lime concrete up there. It'd be nice to have another green uh, between here or there or something, but relatively, you know, a kind of a straight path. Not the easiest transition to make. Let's clear those and do the OK Lab in RGB space. So if you look at these blocks, they have this curve to them that goes up all the way through the middle, and then up and around to bamboo, and then over to lime. But if we change over to OK Lab, this almost becomes a straight line. Maybe, you know, you could have went from wool up to uh, orange terracotta. And then maybe if there was another block, like right around here in this color would have been good where I'm at, and then over. But um, I guess unsurprisingly, both the RGB transitions, like we did in our earlier examples, there's a deepening, a darkening of colors like in the middle. I actually prefer the OK Lab like in, in both cases. For the uh, blue to sandstone one, it's not that dramatic. There is not a straight path that you could take just because, again, we're missing this whole swath of color here. There's not a lot of colors over here in, uh, in Minecraft that we can use for blocks. But um, generally going down and across, big gaps between colors and then kind of getting over to here so we can make a smoother transition. If we look at the OK Lab version of that, not that much different. At least in RGB space, it goes over there and then down. But uh, let's convert it to OK Lab space to see how this actually lines up in OK Lab. Yeah, so in OK Lab, it's more more of a straight line there's like a little bit of a twist like you go down and like twist to get down to here i'm uh, genuinely shocked i wasn't actually sure if i would use ok lab in minecraft very much just because i'm more accustomed to uh you know hsv and stuff like that but uh this actually uh really changed my opinion it's probably going to be my go-to space for uh for working with colors and everything i'm uh yeah i don't know i'm almost at a loss for words i'm really surprised uh this is great. One other thing with the uniform color space is that if hypothetically someone was going to revisit the missing colors of Minecraft and do it in a more scientific manner, this would be an important step. These gradients also highlight something that will probably be the focus of the next color video. And that's texture noise in blocks. Like even though this melon is a good average color, the individual colors of the texture make it too noisy to use for most things. And I'm going to do an episode kind of talking about that a bit. 
Before I go, I want to give a shout out to the Axiom mod and its creator, Mulberry. He released a video a few weeks ago talking about CIE lab space. He's adding it into the mod and it will pull color data from not just vanilla blocks, but also resource packs and then dynamically generate a color space like this. I'll have a link to the video down in the description as well as a world download for this world in case you wanted to play around with it. An actual setting you need to adjust to make sure this works right is under video settings, uh, entity distance, you need to have this set to 200%. And otherwise, when you're up on this platform, some of these can't be visible. I'm going to get back to working on the next geology episode. I'll see you guys next time, and I hope you have a nice day.